Hey everyone, um, we see people are starting to file in. Um, I'm Heather with NAS Solar Electric. Um, my screen says Therese, but that is not correct. I'm Heather, hi. Um, the NAS team is here and the Midnight Solar team is here and we are just waiting for more people to pop in and we will get this started at about two after. All right, about one more minute and we'll get started. All right, um, we're going to go ahead and get started. We're probably going to have people filing in a little bit um, afterwards, but I wanted to start by uh, thank you for being here for this webinar on the new Rosie 7048 inverter from Midnight Solar. I'm Heather with NAS Solar Electric, and I have James and Therese here with me today. I know my screen says Therese, but it's Heather. Um, so we're really excited to share with you um, all of the new stuff coming out from Midnight Solar. Um, we've got a very quick itinerary, um, which James will show you here. Um, we are just gonna say hello real quick, um, and then we're going to jump right into having Ryan from uh, Midnight Solar share all of the information. We also have a special offer that we're going to be offering at the end of the webinar. Then James and Therese are gonna talk just a little bit, and then we'll take questions and answers at the end. When it's time for questions and answers, and we'll reiterate this information later, just drop it on the right, in the panel on the right hand side where it says questions. If you want your mic turned on so you can speak, just say, I want my mic turned on, we'll turn your mic on. Otherwise you can just type your question. Um, we also have a video on the Rosie Inverter on our on our YouTube channel. So if you go to Nasol or Electric, um, we'll also drop this in the chat link so you can find it. But after uh, the webinar, if you want to check out the video we did where we ran some tests on the Rosie Inverter, that is on our YouTube channel. We are also going to record this webinar. Um, so we'll be turning that recording on soon. We'll get this recorded and we'll also post this on our YouTube channel by the end of the week. Um, so thank you, Midnight Solar, for taking the time today to um, let us talk a little bit about this stuff and share this with our audience. Um, just want to tell you a little bit about NAS Solar Electric. If you are not um, familiar with NAS, um, James, if you want to flip to the next screen. Um, we have been around for over 40 years helping people plug into solar. We do engineering, distribution, and support. Um, so we have a team of engineers who do solutions for our customers. We distribute the equipment. We provide technical support. Um, we support all of our customers for the life of their system, and we provide this for our customers around the world. We specialize in residential and commercial applications. Um, so now I would like to turn this over to Ryan from Midnight Solar, and he is going to talk to you about the Rosie Inverter. So we'll go ahead and share our screen with Ryan, let him get started. Um, again, I do have James and Therese from my team who will be um, 
take, uh, talking to you a little bit at the end of the webinar and answering your questions. And thanks everyone for being here. All right, thank you. Can uh, everybody hear me okay? All right, so, so that you good. can hear me well, so we will keep on rolling here. So uh, as mentioned, it's gonna be kind of fast paced. Um, we're gonna hit the highlights here. We're gonna talk about the new products that Midnight is rolling or already rolled out for 2023, specifically really focusing on the new Rosie 7,000 watt split phase inverter. Um, but just a little backstory about Midnight, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, we've been involved in this forever. We've uh, we've got roots back to the days of Trace Engineering, um, Xantrex, Outback, uh, Midnight, you know, we, our founders owned Owned Outback. We now have a lot of the employees from Magnum since Magnum moved out of the country. Uh, we got a lot of the trace employees. We're in some of the same buildings. It's kind of a, kind of an interesting little area out there. So if anybody ever finds their way out to the Arlington, Washington area, which is like 45 minutes north of Seattle, um, you know, let us know. Robin loves to give tours of the facility. Um, you might see some of the old employees, but one of the largest manufacturers of PV combiners, and of course, you know what we consider a pretty long running famous classic charge controller that most of you are probably aware of. But let's jump right into it. Um, we're here today to talk specifically about the Rosie and the Rosie E-Panel. The Rosie comes in a couple models. We're gonna focus a lot on what we call the RE, Renewable Energy Model. We'll talk a little bit about the mobile, mo uh, mobile as well, but not quite as much. And then we'll talk about the E-Panel. So, the Rosie is 7,000 watts, has a surge power of almost 3X, so it'll surge up to about 20 kilowatts. It is 122.40-60 hertz split phase out of the box, and it is a 48 volt nominal battery based inverter. So you will need a, will need a battery that's 48 volts nominal or about there. Um, it runs up to, I think, 65 volts DC on the high end. We did actually have a customer the other day that has a 60 volt lithium and uh, everything seems to be working well, but that was kind of a strange lithium battery we hadn't been introduced to yet. Some of the cool features of the Rosie, uh, two auxiliary terminals, um, 15 different auxiliary modes, if you will, like uh, vent fan, some kinds of diversions, different things like that for opportunity relays, if you will. The Rosie does also have two wire generator start you know, built in. The Rosie is listed to 1741 and CSA. The mobile Rosie is listed to 1741, 458 and CSA. So if you need a mobile version, we do have that. 120 amps DC maximum charge current. And as a kind of a standard feature, the e-panel comes with Wizbang Junior. You do not have to use it in the e-panel. You can use it in one of our battery combiners somewhere else, but if you put a Wizbang Junior in the system, you get state of charge showing up as a percentage on your display. The Rosie can do a lot of things with state of charge, start and stop a generator. Um, a lot of features are actually being released in the beta firmware in the next week that function on state of charge, like grid support. Uh, I'm thinking low battery cutout. A lot of those functions that historically we've done on battery voltage, we're transitioning to give you the ability to do them either on voltage or state of charge. because with the new lithium batteries, everybody's starting to jump into them. Uh, voltage is not such a great representation of state of charge as state of charge is itself. The display that you'll need for this, the MNGP2 that we'll show you a little later, does have voice like the Classic does. You can turn the voice off or you can set it for quiet time. Uh, battery temperature compensation with the included BTS. The one thing I'm going to mention here is that we do a lot more with that BTS. So historically, if you've used like a classic or some of our competitors' inverters, the battery temperature is only for compensating that voltage, that charge voltage for battery temperature. So if the battery lead acid battery is cold, we raise that voltage. If the battery is warm, we lower that voltage. Well, now with the Rosie, we're doing a lot more with that. We're, we're letting you set um, the low temperature stop charge, the high temperature stop charge, you know, we're, we're really, there's a lot more software in the Rosie to deal with like a lithium battery than there would have been in like a classic, for example. Um, another feature we have, I don't see it on this bullet point, but it'll probably be on the next slide. So I apologize for being out of order, but remote battery sense. That's something that we got beat up a lot on the classic. 
Um, everybody wanted to see remote battery voltage sense. So the new equipment has that and it operates on that. So if you hook up the remote battery sense and it's within 1.5 volts of the actual battery voltage internally, it will use that remote battery voltage sense instead. That's what it'll actually display and everything. The other cool thing about that is that's how we're doing closed loop communications with lithium batteries is they're going to just supply us with the remote battery voltage and we are just automatically act on that. So it's a real seamless integration, if you will. Uh, but there is there is a 1.5 volt delta. If it is greater than that, the units will throw a uh, RBS out of range error. Um, if you've done something like hooked up to 24 volts of your 48 volt battery or whatever that case may be, um, or if your wiring really has a big problem. Uh, 1.5 volts is a lot, so you probably won't see that. We'll talk about the e-panel a little later. The Rosie does have a 60 amp internal transfer relay per leg, so 60 amps at 122.40. And super easy to program. One of the nice things about the new system is that it all speaks CAN bus, they all talk to each other, and products get adopted. So let's say you put a Rosie on the wall, or let's say you start for Hawks Bay, and you put the Hawks Bay on the wall, you've got it charging your battery, and then you buy a Rosie from Nas, you hang it on the wall, the Rosie just automatically gets adopted. All the programming is just integrated right into it from the current system. Um, it's just real streamlined installation process. There's a singular battery section where you program everything about your battery and any device you plug in just automatically uh, you know, gets that. So some of the real meat and potatoes, 35 watt idle while it's making 122.40, five watt idle in search mode, Search mode's a little different than what you're used to with like a transformer based inverter. Functionally, it'll it'll operate the same way. You set the wattage that you want it to come out of search in, but you're not going to hear that pulsing of a transformer like you would have on a Magnum. It's just sitting there looking for a load at low power, and as soon as it sees a load, it comes on. We talked about battery voltage sense. We talked about AGS, two wire start and stop on you know voltage time of day state of charge stop on going to float things like that uh, it will actually do multiples too so you can set it up to start on voltage and state of charge so whichever one comes first there's a, a lot of flexibility there and we talked about battery ag agnostic um, 40 to 65 volts dc is its range that it will operate into um, you can use lead acid, you can use lithium, you can use anything that looks like a battery. The one interesting thing about the Rosie, we've done a lot of testing and experimenting and engineering on small battery banks. So historically, we've always said, you know, we recommend, the industry that is, has always said we recommend around 100 amp hours of battery per kilowatt of PV, you know, running through the system. So if you had like a Rosie and you had 6,000 watts of PV, Historically, we would have said, you know, around 600 amp hours of battery. We are testing Rosies on 50 amp hour and 100 amp hour batteries, and we're working out a lot of the nuances that we see on those small batteries, and that just makes the system even smoother on large batteries. But the, the that old, you know, analogy of 100 amp hours per kilowatt, really, we can be a lot more stingy if we need to with batteries. That being said, you know, definitely reach out to Nas and talk to them before you just buy some lithium battery that's 50 amp hours. Because the BMS is a lot of different BMS can have some quirks in it if, if it's not, if there's not enough ampacity behind it to power things, there is some startup surge on the Rosie and things like that. But it is, it is more, uh, more flexible. We do have closed loop really close to done with three or four brands now, uh, Home Grid, Discover, uh, I can't remember the other two off the top of my head, but those are those are real close. You'll see something from Sue in a uh, constant contact, and you know, when that happens, but we're getting super close. The MNGP2 is required. So one thing we did say right from the very beginning is we're just going to require you have this programming module, this interface. Uh, a lot of inverters can run without it, and the Rosie can run without it once it's programmed. So if you don't want your customer to have buttons, they, they can, can push or whatever. You can take it with you if you want. The MNGP2 does do some system coordination. So when you have a large system, it is in charge of making everybody go to float or bulk or EQ or whatever that may be. Um, so there are some reasons to leave it in there, but you absolutely do need one the initial time. Um, batteries are just way too expensive and they're all way too different. Just assume that an inverter can run by default and, and charge your battery. So 
absolutely need one of those. And if you're buying a, one of our charge controls, you'll have that with it, with it. So some of the unique features of the Rosie, um, grid support. So grid support is a mode where it will not sell to the grid, but it will power the loads um, as much as it possibly can. So if you set it for like battery voltage and you set it for 52.4, for example, as soon as the sun comes up and starts to charge the battery, as soon as it goes above 52.4, the Rosie will power the loads. And when it drops to 52.4, it'll start to throttle the loads back part way. And, um, sorry about that. And it will, uh, you know, uh, run from the, the grid. So basically it'll prioritize the grid versus the, uh, the solar and, and let you run like that. You can set it up for state of charge. You can set it up for battery voltage. The other thing you can do is you can set it up for support based on the input breaker. So if you, let's say you had a Rosie in your RV or there was a reason you didn't want your Rosie to draw much power, small generator would be another great example. You've got an off-grid system and you've got a 2000 watt Harbor Freight inverter generator. You can set the Rosie up to have an input breaker size limit. And if some big load comes onto the Rosie, it'll draw the rest out of the battery and not overload the generator. Um, Something I do want to point out there, which I think I probably have a slide for later, but I'm going to digress. I'm, I'm very random sometimes, and I apologize for that. But the Rosie will run from a single 120 volt input. So if you had that Harbor Freight 2000 watt inverter generator, and the Rosie's putting out 120 to 40, you can put 120 volts to L1 or 120 volts to L2, and it will charge the battery and make the other leg and still put out 240 volts to the loads. The Rosie can be also set to 120 only out if you wanted to. Uh, another mode it has, which we use this actually in our house in Florida to run air conditioning, is the VDC connect and disconnect. So what this does is this just opens the relay and closes the relay to the grid. So you know a, a typical battery-based inverter, when the relay is closed internally, everything on the load side is being powered from the grid basically it, it closes the relay it goes into what we call like a standby or a silent mode and passes through the grid to the loads and the loads get powered so in the vdc connect and disconnect what it will do is when the voltage is above a set point that you select it will open that relay it ignore the utility grid and power the loads from the batteries in the sun until it drops below another set point that you program and then it will close the relay and power from the grid. And that those set points can be based on voltage or state of charge. So again, coming back to that lithium, you could set it for 50% state of charge to close the relay and you know 80% to open. You wanna let it charge up some or whatever before it opens up. So that's kind of a neat feature. Uh, time of use, same similar type thing where we can tell it, hey, between you know, four o'clock in the afternoon, eight o'clock in the afternoon, we want you to open the relay and ignore the utility grid. We don't want to buy that power at that time or whatever the case may be, but you can block out a time where it will ignore the utility grid. So we talked a little bit in the beginning. Um, there is a mobile and there's an RE version. The renewable energy version, you know, off grid, it's listed to 1741 in CSA. The neutrals are common, so you can you know wire it up just like you would any other house because your normal house has a neutral to ground bond somewhere in the system. You can only have one, but you have to have one in the U.S. And it's usually in your main you know service entrance panel or wherever that may be. The mobile version, on the other hand, requires what we call neutral to ground bond switching. So you know I'm not going to go too deep down into that. Guys over at NOS can fill you in on that. They they know in their sleep they understand the mobile market, so they, they can explain that to you. But in a nutshell, if your RV is boondocking out in the wild, you still have to have that neutral to ground bond somewhere in the RV. But when you pull into the your, you know, KOA and you plug in a 50 amp pedestal, there's a bond in that pedestal already because it's a um, you know service at the campground. So the bond cannot be made in the, for a second time in the RV. So the, the mobile inverters have that switching the new circuit boards coming out soon will have a very easy way to disable that if need be. The ones that we're shipping now, I think you have to take one screw out of a circuit board to disable that function. Uh, but that is in there. The only other difference in them is the mobile version is listed to 458. 
So one of the things I wanted to kind of beat on a little bit here, and I think I'm probably, yeah, I've got a good amount of time left. Um, I want to talk about the difference between a high frequency and a low frequency inverter. So one of the things you'll hear a lot um, from people like Midnight or maybe Solark is that transfer times, you know, it's almost zero transfer times. So what do we mean by that? Well, historically, if you've had a, a battery-based inverter like a Trace or a Magnum or an Outback or whatever they may be, there's a relay inside there. And that relay moves the loads either from the grid or from the inverter. So the, the, if you can picture a double pole, double throw relay, it's got a common terminal and it's got a normally open and normally closed. The common is your loads in a transformer-based inverter. And the wiper goes back and forth between either the uh, grid or the inverter. So when you connect to the inverter to the grid, that's why you see that click in the lights because that relay has to switch over to that. Whereas in a high frequency inverter, all the relay does is connect the grid to the inverter. It never moves the loads. The loads are always 100% of the time connected to the inverter section of the, of the inverter. So the rows of the inverter's output is always connected to your loads 100% of the time what you're doing when you hear that relay clunk is you're actually connecting the grid to the inverter module and paralleling everything together. So as such, as there's a couple distinct advantages to this. The, the first one being is that you're not moving anything under load. So those of you that have used the battery-based inverters, I mean, I've done hundreds of these. Everybody in this room probably has, and everybody in this room has probably had a relay that's stuck at one point or another um, from heavy loads being moved back and forth. So with, with the high-frequency inverters, that relay no longer transitions under load. We sync to the grid, we close the relay, and then we ramp up the load onto the grid. And if we're going to open the relay, of course, we sync to that grid and we you know, reduce the current to zero before we open it. And we sync to the grid by moving the voltage up and down. So if you want to push power to the grid, you push your voltage higher than the grid and the current flows out into the grid. If you want to pull power from the grid, you drop your inverter module's voltage below the grid, and it will pull power from the grid. So it's, it's kind of like, you know, two ends of a garden hose that's full of water. If you pick one end up in the air, it runs out the other. It's the same concept. But that's, that's the first huge thing is that you will not get welded relays because they're never moving under load. The second one is you do get a much quicker transfer time because there is no, you know, the loads are never being dropped, if you will. The inverter module is always making power. So when the grid fails, you should see almost no flicker in the light whatsoever. And some of the other things that I like to talk about, um, surge power. Uh, you know, high frequency, not surge, doesn't have a huge transformer. Uh, and that's just not true. If it's built correctly, high frequency can surge better than a low frequency inverter. Where this um, wife's tail or whatever you may want to call it comes from is all these inexpensive or cheap you know, inverters that are on the market. Like if you go into Walmart, go into the automotive section, you can buy a thousand watt inverter for 50 bucks, whatever that number is. And that inverter will not surge. That's hundred percent correct. That is a very low budget, inexpensive, unreliable inverter. Whereas, you know, if you get into an inverter like a Rosie or a Solark or something like that, you're getting a high quality inverter and they are built correctly. They will surge. Um, load balance, imbalance is more important. And this is true. So those of you that have used the Solark before, you've, you've already been, you know, brought into this camp. And this is true, whereas like a, a Xantrex uh, or a Snyder XW inverter has that transformer to balance the two legs internally, you can kind of lop one side of it real heavy and not worry about it. With the high frequency inverter, you do need to be a little more conscious about balancing your 120 volt loads. So if you've got, you know, a real heavy 120 volt hitters in your home, Try to balance them out between L1 and L2. Don't put them all on one leg, which is actually something that electricians are supposed to do when they wire a house is balance the loads. But that's something you need to keep in mind. But do also remember that the Rosie will surge to 10 kilowatts per leg. So while we do say you should keep a little bit of thought into balancing them, it's not as important as one might think. Uh, probably one of the big pluses of high frequency is less weight. Uh, anybody in this room that's lifted a Snyder XW Pro or a Sunny Island or something like that knows what I'm talking about. This is seven kilowatts and weighs, I believe, 42 pounds. We've got a slide on it here in a minute. 
but this thing just is easy to log, easy to mount. It's not going to uh, break your back, get it on the wall. The other advantage of high frequency is adaptability. What I mean by that is you can have a single inverter like a Rosen that can do 120, 240, 60 hertz, 120 only auto sensing if you want it to be. Uh, you can do 230, 50 hertz with the push of a button, um, all sorts of interesting things. Like all of a sudden now it can auto detect 2083 phase instead of 120, 240 if you're in an RV park that has two legs of, of a three phase instead of split phase. So there's a lot of cool stuff that you can do with high frequency. The, the 120 volt auto sensing is, is pretty cool. Um, if you've got an RV that has a 50 amp service entrance, you have split phase 240 going in that RV. If you now take your 30 amp dog bone, and some of you that are not familiar with camping won't know what I'm saying here, but when you take a 30 amp dog bone, the 30 amp service in the campground is 120 only 30 amps instead of 120, 240, 50 amps. And what that dog bone does is it takes the leg one from the 30 amp 120 and it splits it and it ties it to both leg one and leg two on your 50 amp plug on your RV. So now all of a sudden the Rosie is going to see 120 volt in phase on L1 and L2. And on the mobile version, that will auto sense that and switch to 120 mode only and uh, charge off both legs. The other thing you'll hear a lot is that, you know, high frequency will, will struggle with inductive loads. And this really comes back to the bullet point number one, where if the product is built correctly, that's just not true. Um, if you have a real inexpensive build, that can very well be true. But you're not going to have any trouble with inductive loads on the Rosie. If anything, I would say that our Rosie seems more tolerant of a lot of those odd loads and a lot of the transformer-based inverters I've played with. And I'm fairly unbiased here. I mean, I do work for Midnight and I collect a paycheck for Midnight. But most of the manufacturers know that they can send me an inverter to hang on the wall and test, and I'll give them my honest opinion. And so I've played with a lot of this stuff, and it's, uh, it's not always easy. But I will say that the Rosie seems to do really well with inductive loads. So I'm going to go a little bit into our breaker box, probably not as deep as I have slides because it is just a breaker box, but it is styled to match. It's cast aluminum, just like the Rosie. It does have a 300 amp battery breaker, a 60 amp bypass, um, connections for surge arresters, and you, know, you can also get the option of backplate. So if you want to wire these in your shop uh, before you go out to the job site, you can bolt all three pieces on the backplate. I believe it's 62 pounds complete, ready to go. Yeah, there we go. 42 pounds with the inverter, 62 pounds with the back plate. UPS shippable, that's another cool thing. Um, you can actually get, no, somebody a UPS ship you one of these pre-wireds, you know, even overnight if you need this, if there's a real bind or a real time crunch, you're not waiting for the trucking industry to get something to you anymore. And this is an internal picture of, of both of them. The Rosie's on the top, shows you the connections um, across here, shows you the connections in your e-panel. Over here on the left-hand side of the Rosie, I don't have a better picture than this of it, but I don't really, it's, it's not that important. This is where your CAN bus jacks are and all your other jacks for your Wisbank Junior and remote battery voltage sense and all of that. The CAN bus does have to be terminated. So those of you that have not used like an XW system or a SMA system, uh, CAN bus, basically every, every product will have two ports. They are in parallel, so there is no in or out, doesn't matter. And you have to plug any empty port. So when the system is done, you'll end up with two ports, one on either end of the chain that's empty, and you will plug that. All of our products come with one Terminator plug with them, so you'll have plenty of Terminator plugs to plug those ports. But that is one caveat of CAN buses. You do have to terminate both ends of it. So that's kind of it in a nutshell for the Rosie. I'm going to try to get through some MPPT stuff and a couple of battery combiners real quick so I can get it back over to the good people of NAS here and we can keep on trucking. But we do have to go with this. We have two 600 volt charge controllers that we released shortly before we released the Rosie, actually. We have the Barcelona and the Hawks Bay. They both have all the same specs electrically except for the throughput. So the Barcelona is, I think, maybe the world's biggest charge controller. It is 600 volt DC input, 200 amps out at 48 volt DC. It has dual MPPTs. 
So two completely independent 100 amp MPVT modules in ter inside of the thing, you know, one computer module, but the two channels, tracking channels are independent. They will track from 185 to 585 volts DC. Uh, they do also have remote battery voltage sense. Now, battery voltage sense, battery temperature sense, et cetera, you only need one in the system. So if you had, say, four Barcelonas and two Rosies, only one battery temperature sensor and only one remote battery voltage sense circuit is actually needed. If you hook up more than one, the system will ignore all but one of them. So there's no danger, but you do only need one. We do also offer something really cool with these new products, and this is kind of like uh, one of those things we as an industry have been skirting around, but ground fault protection. So we've been required to have ground fault protection forever. And now, since 2020, NEC has kind of gone into this thing where they have a, a reference grounded and a solidly grounded system. And if your system is what's considered reference grounded, you have to have two pole breakers on everything because your negative is now considered current carrying. And I'm not, I'm not going to go into this because this could be a whole webinar in itself, but essentially if the system doesn't have a solid bond between negative and ground, just like your AC does of the proper size, then your negative is considered current carrying and you need, you know, a breaker on that every way you have a breaker on the positive. The ground fault system in the Barcelona and the Hawks Bay uses differential current on the PV leads to detect ground fault. So therefore you can actually solidly ground the battery system and get, you know, a, still get ground fault and get around that. And it's a fairly inexpensive module. It is an optional module, module because not everybody wants ground fault and arc fault. But if you do require that in your system, there is an optional module that you can plug in. We'll show you here in a little bit. Uh, other than that, it's fairly similar to everything else. It's got data logging for 360 days, two auxiliary input outputs, voice enunciations. It does have Bluetooth, uh, and the Bluetooth is currently only used for firmware updates. So if you want to update your firmware, there is a couple different cell phone apps. One is for beta firmware, and the other one is for for production firmware. So the midnight way of doing firmware is to, we release it as what we call alpha to a very core group of people. And once that group of people is happy, then it goes to what we call beta, where anybody that wants access to it has access to it, but it's, you know, it's not quite as tested as production firmware. And then after, you know, usually three to four weeks of being in beta with no problems, we'll roll it into a production at that time. With all these new products, a lot of the features get driven by you guys. So when you call or when folks in Oz call us and say, hey, it would be really nice if this could do this. Um, that's why we do the firmware updates as often as we do. It's just adding the features that people need, new features that are up and coming, stuff like that. Uh, the only thing that doesn't work on the MPPTs right now, I believe that's coming soon is the remote battery voltage sense. That should be released by early July. Everything else, I believe, is, is good to go on that one. So the Hawks Bay, um, again, I won't spend a ton of time on it because it's exactly like the Barcelona, only just about half as much fun. So there's two models of this. is a 90 amp and a 120 amp model, and they're single MPPT. All the other characteristics are exactly the same, just single MPPT versus dual MPPT, and 90 amp or 120 amp model. The uh, it's really just going to boil down to your modules. We have a string sizing tool on our website now, but if you're using modules that gets you to the point where a 90 amp works for you, it saves you a few bucks. Or if you want to get a couple strings in play and they're big modules, the 120 amp version may be the way to go. Yeah, and this is the, I'm not even going to go down this road. This is just comparing costs between high voltage arrays and low voltage arrays. At the end of the day, there's a place for both. There's a place for low voltage PV and there's a place for high voltage PV. It's uh, it's kind of fun. If you haven't played a voltage drop calculators, um, I love calculator.net, um, the voltage drop calculator. Just build an array, build, build something that's, you know, say 300 feet of wire and 25 amps of current and then start playing with the DC voltage and watch the voltage drop go down as the uh, voltage goes up and it's actually pretty amazing yeah, what you can do at 600 volts or you know 400 volt and you want to use your mppt voltage not your voc when you're doing that voltage drop calculator 
but there's definitely places for both. And uh, I do have a question on the Bluetooth. Uh, let me see if I can get that pulled out here so I can read it. Disable, re-enable, uh, apologize. My window's not as big as it should be. There we go. Um, have the inverter and charge controller be tested for RF emissions? I remember that some testing was done on the classic charge controller. Also wondering if it's possible to disable and re-enable the Bluetooth. So two questions. Uh, second question, easy one, Bluetooth, yes. Uh, there's a user button on the display there. You go into the MNGP2, you scroll to Bluetooth, you disable it, and you can always get past it. So you, even if you forget to re-enable it, it's always enabled for 30 seconds on boot up. So if you power the unit down and power it up, the cell phone app will always catch it, even if you don't go, you know, re-enable it. But you can go re-enable it. Uh, testing for RF, we've done a ton of it. Um, one thing to note is that I'm going to say probably 80% of the applications engineers and, and engineers at Midnight Solar are amateur radio operators. So that's something that's near and dear to our heart is making sure that we don't put out a lot of RF. Um, FCCB always comes up, but the ironic part about FCCB is it doesn't really apply to the bands that amateur radio operators use. It can be a little bit of an indication the product is maybe better than other products, but we haven't gone down that road yet with FCCB, but we will. Um, but yes, just from an RF standpoint, the, the units themselves are really good. If you run into something where you're trying to make a quieter site, reach out to us. Uh, reach out to me, you know, Ryan at MidnightSolo.com. There's a lot of tricks that we can give you um, to help quiet a system down. Some seem really simple, like you know, wrapping battery cables together before between A and B, but there's a lot of stuff we can do to quiet these down. So um, breaker boxes, real quickly, we'll go over them, and then we'll uh, I think we'll get into the questions and answers once we get through the uh, battery combiner. So the only unique thing about the Hawks Bay and Barcelona breaker boxes, other than the fact that they're styled to match and they have the proper breakers in them, is they have a shunt trip PV breaker. So a while back, um, somebody came to us, I think it was Simplify actually, and said, hey, you know, we've had other charge controllers that fail. When they fail, they pass PV voltage through. And when our BMS sees that, some bad things can happen. So one of the things we did early days was we created a circuit in the 600 volt charge controllers that's completely analog and completely independent of everything in the charge controller that will actually trip the breaker if the P, if the battery voltage exceeds 68 volts. So if there's ever that really weird like triple failure of the unit and all of a sudden your 500 volt array is trying to pass through to the battery, as soon as that battery instantaneously hits 600 volts, it will trip that breaker. The other thing that can trip it is arc fault. If there is an arc fault detector in the system, when an arc fault is detected, it will trip that breaker as well to open that breaker. So that's really the the other part of it. Um, it's really there, you know, it's it's an elegant box. It mates neatly. It's not very expensive. Gives you all the proper breakers and everything. Makes installation a breeze. Um, the other thing we're doing moving forward here, which we will be rolling out hopefully by mid-year is we're actually introducing what we're going to call a, uh, a certified installer program where we'll have a training class for our installers. And with that, um, if a customer gets a product of ours installed by a certified installer, they do get an additional warranty as well. So there's some things there. Um, and if you buy one of our pre-wired systems, you get an additional warranty. And I've lost my button to advance my slides. There we go. So we talked about the remote trip. They do have, you know, the spaces for the SPDs. There's the Barcelona box. Same thing, it just has two PV breakers. The one unique thing about the Barcelona box is it has studs on the bottom of it, like an inverter. So remember, it's 200 amps. You're using like two watt cable here, maybe even four watt cable. So it has studs on the bottom to connect to instead of a, a terminal block like a typical charge controller. And here's your options board. Um, basically, this board under the arrow comes factory installed. And these two little daughter cards that you see over here on the right, you can purchase as kits and plug in. One is for rapid shutdown, which we haven't released yet. And the other one is for arc fault and ground fault. And they will come with their toroids, as you see here, run the proper cable through them per the instructions. 
mm-hmm. as your arc fault detector. The arc fault detector only wants to have one PV wire through it. Either the positive or the negative, we usually recommend the negative. But the ground fault needs both because remember, it's looking for the differential current between the two. So this sensor is seeing zero current. When it sees more than, say, 750 milliamps, it's going to detect a fault and shut your unit down. And if you're using a Barcelona, you run all four PV wires through it, both positives and negatives. Which does bring me to something that I didn't mention was that when you're using these six and volt charge controls, we recommend you run your PV negative directly to the controller and not land it on a neg- common negative bus bar. This is a device that's coming out soon. This is a standalone arc fault, ground fault detection device. If you've got a system you're upgrading and charge controller doesn't support it, we're hoping by probably sometime Q3 on that one. And we talked about this earlier, but the, the solidly grounded versus negatively uh, versus reference grounded. Uh, I'm not going to spend any time on that, but if anybody's got any questions, definitely feel free to reach out to NAS or Midnight Solar. We'll help you on that. Yeah, and this is just talking about the safety of a, a typical array with the typical ground fault breaker like we sell when it blows. It can actually make things that are hot that you don't expect to be hot, like a chassis or something like that. And that's why the new, you know, solidly rounded system is much safer. Ground fault was okay back when we had low voltage arrays and PWM charge controllers. But now that we're up to 600 volts, you really, you know, you need to, we need to be more safe and, and more uh, conscious of people's safety. Uh, here's something else that we've released, the 2000 amp battery combiner and the 500 amp battery combiner which i don't have on this slide oh coming soon so we have a 500 amp battery combiner a 2000 amp and of course the old traditional thousand amp the 500 amps a little different in that you uh i actually think nas was the one that requested this it does not come with the shunt so it was brought to our attention that most people don't use a shunt in these things so the 500 amp, we really work to keep the cost way down and make a nice little combiner box. And if you want the shunt, you can buy the shunt or you can rob it out of your e panel and put it in there. Um, but that's the only difference between them. Yep, and uh, I think that's about it for me. Um, you all know our combiners. I'm trying to get us on schedule here. So I am going to pass this back over to good folks in Oz here. I can figure out how to do that, so bear with me. I think I just got it, maybe? Yeah, uh, let's see here. Okay, can you see my screen? I can, yep. Awesome, all right, it's my turn. <laughs> Ryan, feel free to chime in uh, whenever you want. Um, but basically, I'm going to provide a little bit of my personal input on the Rosie, uh, nothing but good things to say. Um, Midnight was gracious enough to send us one to abuse, uh, which all reputable manufacturers should do. Uh, because we will put them through the ringer, and if they pass our tests, we will do things like this, where we have a webinar, and we talk about all the good things to say. So, um, first thing is, uh, first things first here, I want to say it's time to replace your old trace inverter. All right, we just got to get that off. I mean, <laughs> Brian, you said, you know, you guys stem from trace, like, it's like 20 plus years now it's time to replace the trace, right? Like, and I think honestly, the Rosie might be the ticket. Um, you know, it's an inverter that's manufactured by an American company. Um, there's really only a handful of inverters that could say that. And most of them uh, are kind of out of date at this point. So um, with the perception that this thing has been manufactured with the intent to work properly with lithium batteries you know it has some shoes that it can easily fill and now that most of our clients are transitioning to that type of chemistry 
um, it surely makes sense for for uh, one to consider this product. Um, plus, Midnight has a long-standing reputation for manufacturing quality equipment and having responsible service. And so, why would you want to go with you know an alternative, uh, cheaper solution? I think this is a, a really steadfast kind of product. So, um, personally, as of right the second. Um, I think the Rosie is perfect for off-grid application. Uh, you know, it's got the 1741 listing from a performance standpoint, which uh, we kind of like Ryan covered a little bit of the technical stuff, but uh, from a performance standpoint, this thing is kind of mind blowing. Um, it, it is like, until you get your hands on it, you're not going to realize how small it is compared to like, other inverters on the market of its similar output. Uh, it's easily a quarter of the weight, if not half the weight, depending on the product you're comparing it to, and easily a quarter of the size. Uh, I mean, compare it to like a Radian, for example, or even a Schneider, you know, XW inverter. This thing kind of puts it to shame with respect to how it weighs, how much it weighs, and, and the physical dimensions that it, you know, occupies. Um, the uh let's see here so we just did a video that sort of it's like an abridged version of of some of the tests we put it through uh just to uh kind of see what it was capable of and i have a picture up here that i'll explain here in a second because it kind of doesn't make any sense until i talk about it but um basically in that video uh we we took in we the rosie and basically used a bunch of loads that would typically make your average inverter of like this sit, scale size and output just fail. High frequency switching inverter would not do this, right? So running a chop saw, an old crappy thrown through the ringer, air compressor, um, a skill saw, a resistive heat gun and running those things all at exactly the same time as well. So, you know, like we, we had this chop saw going and a skill saw going and a heat gun, and then we kick the air compressor on and it just, it just starts immediately. No stutter, no nothing just comes. It's just doesn't make any sense because if you actually start testing other inverters on the market and you try to do that, you're going to see stutter. You're going to see inverters poop out. It just doesn't work, but the Rosie just does it. It's like a magic. Joe, it, it's crazy. Um, yeah, on I top my, of that, what? I, just, I think my favorite explanation or display of that was our booth at SPI, where we had a Rosie run on four hundred amp car batteries, powering four Dewalt air compressors and eleven kilowatts of light bulb. And everybody in this room probably knows a gentleman named Jack Krause, but he came by and wanted to see the surge capability of the Rosie. And with all those loads on and the Rosie off, I had him turn the battery breaker onto the Rosie right from a cold start. Everything took right off, no stutter, no hesitation. And uh, that's fairly impressive load. It is. It is very impressive. Um, and I really can't say there's a lot of other inverters that can do that. And the other thing that's really impressive is, I mean, I used uh, I used the Rosie on a EV charger and ran – so. An, an electric vehicle is like the best load for testing inverters because it, it can be very consistent. You can run easily like 40 kilowatt hours through the inverter, uh, you know, a continuous load for several hours. Um, and, and you can scale that load from geez, 1500 watts all the way up to almost 12 kilowatts and you can really test things. So you can really dial in exactly what you want to draw from, you know, your, your your inverter and test it so i mean i hit the uh the rosie for like an hour of, of charging the ev at 240 volts and i got bored um so then i and that's kind of what this picture is illustrating here is then i took an auto transformer hooked 120 volts through the auto transformer and then stepped it up to 240 volts so i could actually put a decent load on the rosie at 120 volts and then i proceeded to draw seven and a half seven kilowatts of load at 120 volts off the Rosie. And you can see here on the neutral, we're almost at 60 amps. The Rosie did that for easily 10 minutes uh, without any issues. 
Um, and I mean, that, at that point, I was just like, all right, this is this is fine. It, it, it checks out like everything they say. I mean, anybody can say, hey, yeah, you can pull a full load on 120 volts. But until you actually prove it, you're not going to win me over. So, um, yeah, that thing really does do a great job of, of feeding a variety of different loads that would cause most inverters to flunk out pretty easily. So I'm pretty impressed by that. But what it, what I think is also a really interesting and unique perspective on the Rosie is that they've designed this as a also, you know, obviously another version of it as a purpose built mobile solution, which I mean, there's not a whole lot of 48. In fact, I don't think there really are any 48 volt mobile inverters, mobile meaning it has neutral ground switching and listed 485 um, or sorry, 458. Uh, the mobile inverter that's split phase has the ability to recognize the 120 volt inputs in, in, you know, in various conditions, 120, you know, in phase, 208, 240 volt. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ryan, but you provide this thing 120 volts, it'll still maintain 240 volt output, right? Yeah, both, both models will do that. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So, I mean, that's really important too. Like if you're doing a mobile system where you're putting in 240 volt loads, like many, like a lot of people nowadays are customizing their RVs and their boats and stuff to use mini split air conditioners and such, you know, where they need 240 volts, you know, this inverter is kind of unique in the sense that you can you you can put it in an RV and you can easily surge one leg at 120 volts, you know, seven kilowatts, you know, to start your big air conditioners and stuff that are 120 volts, especially these kind of junky RV air conditioners that tend to cause other inverters to uh, trip out. Uh, you know, it will do that because I I know I've tested it. Uh, but on top of that. Um, you know, it can maintain split phase output for your mini split air conditioners at 240 volt or your 240 volt loads. So very unique aspect that this inverter offers. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, that is uh, that is a huge selling factor when it comes to mobile applications. This inverter really might be the ticket uh, for an easy to install mobile solution that's really compact and lightweight uh, that can still maintain, you know, 50 amps pass through capabilities seven kilowatts, eight kilowatts of load, give or take, it, there's nothing else like it. Uh, it. It takes a lot of effort to to create a solution that can do that. Um, very heavy, other products are very heavy and hard to wire and stuff. So I'll, I digress, I can go into much more detail. If you wanna talk about this, call me up. I can talk all day about the advantages this offers for mobile. Um, I will say the MNGP uh, graphics panel for, uh, your average customer is not going to be overwhelming. Uh, it's very intuitive to use. Uh, you know, you can click into the different menus, go and adjust your various settings. It's pretty simple. Um, it also doesn't provide you with an overwhelming amount of information, at least with the firmware version that I have. Um, me, I'm a nerd. I could use more information. I'd love to see what the heck's going on, but most people don't. They don't want to deal with that. It, it's overwhelming. Uh, there's plenty of examples of too many layers of menus and too much information being provided by all the other inverter manufacturers. Um, I feel like the MNGP is very intuitive. I mean, I grabbed it without a manual and just started going in it and figured everything out I needed to, to enable charging and discharging and all that. What was that, Ryan? Yeah, that was definitely our, I said that was definitely our goal. So the, the, you know, one thing that's been beaten into us, and this is actually coming from a couple of our engineers, is the customers don't want to know all this information. So the basic status screens are really just the meat and potatoes that the customer cares about. But you can, like when you're an MPPT, for example, you can roll the knob and dig down into each individual MPPT and get all the geeky details that you want. But from a, a basic overview, we've kept it simple. Yeah, checks out. It is it is very simple. And you know, I think that's important because uh, you know, if you come from, you know, a trace inverter and you try to go into like maybe like an Outback or Schneider, well, with Schneider, you don't even get a display anymore now. So that's like an order of magnitude of more complexity or Victron, you know, like setting them up and stuff is a huge layer of uh, learning that has to come. Um, whereas I think you can pretty much put this thing hanging on the wall and grab the MNGP and just go to town on setting it up. And it's very intuitive. Um, you know, I look forward to 
you know, some of the updates, uh, you know, that will allow for maybe some more depth of uh, information, but nonetheless, I think it's great. Um, Ryan, chime in a little bit here. We didn't, you didn't really touch on this too much, but I hear stacking is like a firmware update away, hopefully, or give or two. Um, yeah. So um, actually, that was just a question that came in. Um, oh, no. Yeah, let me answer sorry. the question. Uh, stacking. So uh, stacking is actually going out in beta here this week. Um, we've been testing it pretty thoroughly. We've actually got a couple mobile um, OEMs testing it as well. Uh, everything seems to be working. Right now, we're seeing two Rosies, um, but the engineering lab has been stacking four with the same results. I don't know if we'll go more than four long term. We probably will, but right now that's our target. So, uh, yeah, you should you should expect to see firmware released this week in beta that will allow stacking uh, of two rosies. Yep. I mean, a few years ago, you know, like the systems we would design, you know, most clients could get away with four to eight kilowatt inverter, and it really wasn't a big deal. Uh, and and I think like you know your average system four to four, you know, a few years ago. 48 kilowatts, the, the one single Rosie would be, you know, perfect. But <laughs> anymore, you know, nowadays with clients pushing EV charging in off grid and, you know, these large household appliances, I think there's certainly, you know, an advantage to having the stacking capabilities. And it's great to hear that, you know, that's just right around the corner and available for beta. So thank you for chiming in on that. And then the other thing, which I think you did touch in on, um, I personally set this up to charge and discharge several different lithium batteries, several different batteries in general, um, even unique chemistries that uh, maybe are not super common. Um, and it's very easy to do. It's very simple, you know, voltage adjustments. Um, the closed loop communications, Ryan, um, with Discover and HomeGrid, I mean, this is, I think, that's all CAN based, I'm assuming, right? Yes, yes, all CAN based, yeah. But now, yeah. yeah. So I mean, the platform is already communicating via CAN, so integrating that seems fairly easy. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's really going to solidify the the Rosie into, you know, that modern market that we're dealing with, uh, with lithium batteries and everything. So that's awesome. Um, so I really quickly just wanted to show uh, two things right now. Uh, we have a few, uh, if, if, I mean, you can buy the pre-wired version, but um, if you wanted to, we have kits with the Hawks Bay and the Barcelona, the 90, the 120, and just the inverter with all the individual parts that you need. So if you needed uh, like the inverter and the charge controller, the back plates, your ground fault um, and arc fault detection, surge arresters, Basically, you can grab this kit, we can UPS it out to you, and it's really easy to assemble. We've already done a couple pre-wired systems for clients, um, you know, a service that we offer as well. Uh, but it's it's really easy to for us to just ship this off. So if you're a contractor and you're trying to do a quick build, I don't think the wiring of this is all that difficult. And these kits pretty much include, for the most part, everything you need to get it going. Um, and so you can check out those kits. Uh, the other thing, uh, that we have kind of touched on a, a few bits here, and I'm not going to uh, play the video, but um, the this video here is is you know what we talked. It just po it literally posted right before this webinar, um, and so you know check that out. And while you're at it, subscribe to our YouTube channel um, so you can see more content like this. It's it's really uh, it's really good information. Um, and really shows what the Rosie is is capable of. So, um, in summary, I think that the Rosie really has a lot of potential uh, to be, you know, to set a new standard for that American inverter. Um, it's been like 10 years since the U.S. market has seen something, well, kind of seen something like this uh, with the design principles that this has taken into consideration, it's it's brand new. Like it, there's nothing else that you can say that an American company has brought to the table with this in mind. Um, and then, uh, you know, like I think that the Rosie really is easily gonna fill the shoes of like Magnum, which pretty much disappeared at this point. 
uh, you know, and, you know, various other manufacturer and in, inverter manufacturers that may have outdated technologies. So that's where I'm going to leave it. And I'm going to hand this over to Therese. If you have any questions, you know, from the performance characteristics and needing assistance with the design and whatnot, all of our team have really dug into this and really messed around with the rosin. So they're all fairly familiar with the, the various aspects of the product. So don't hesitate to give us a call. Oop, oop, oop. There you go. Therese, it's off to you now. Sorry about that. Um, I just wanted to thank everyone so much for joining us today and make sure that everyone does know that at, over here at NAS we do have a wholesale program. We call it our partner program. You can find a link on the website in the uh, blue banner at the top to um, apply to that and we um, we have fantastic relationships with all the great manufacturers like Midnight Solar, and we love to pass on the great pricing we get from them to our installer partners. So um, take advantage of that for by all means. Um, you do get personal treatment. We have fast shipping. We have three warehouses in Flagstaff now that we're stocking a ton of stuff so, um, so we can ship quickly and, um, and give you guys the kind of service that, that you need and you want. So that's about all I have to say. And are we going back to midnight for farewell? I think we have, do we have yeah. any questions that we need to cover, Ryan? We do, we have some questions and then we also had a, uh, a special that we were gonna announce. I assume this would be a good time to announce that as well. Um, something that we worked with NAS on was that if you do purchase a Rosie from them for the month of May and June, so anytime in the next four weeks, basically, we will midnight will give you either two free SPDs or a free MNGP2, depending on what you need. Uh, basically, all we need to see is a receipt from Nas that you purchased the Rosie, and you know we can confirm that you were in the webinar by the uh, email addresses. And so just email sales at midnightsolar.com, and that's something that we wanted to offer the group here today. And then as far as questions, we do have a few. So I'll go down through those real quick. Uh, will there be remote monitoring? That is the million dollar question. And those of you that know Midnight know that Robin has always been kind of old school and like everybody wants a good inverter, but nowadays everybody wants technology. And we are working on that actively. We have an engineer in Florida that's working on what we call the Combox. I don't know what its name will be when we release it to the public, but that's something we expect to start seeing going out here in the next probably two to three months, we're gonna start sending a bunch of beta units out. They do, it's a real powerful unit. It has Modbus, it has RS-45, uh, it runs on Linux. Um, it's kind of open source as well, so that you have some room to do your own thing with it. And the other thing we're gonna do with that too is coordinate other things like classics and kids and stuff with this product line. So yeah, keep an eye on that. That's something we'll see soon. Uh, the other question we have is, will Rosie support sell to the grid in the future? And yes, the uh, the priorities for engineering was stacking, and then immediately after stacking, it was selling to the grid. So that's where they're headed now. They're doing the anti-islanding now. Rosie actually already sells to the grid. It's just commented out, so you can't do it. Um, it's just that they're adding anti-islanding, and then we'll go back through UL to get the approval for that. So that, I suspect, will be done probably Q3 of this year is my guess. Uh, I did have a question on surge current when stacking. And it's just the multiplication, um, it, it really is. You you might lose a little, like if you stack four Rosies, when I said you get 20-ish kilowatts per Rosie, you may not get the full 80, you may get 75, but it's almost 100% current sharing. So that that surge is, is there. There are some caveats to that. And the stacking of Rosies, you will have what we call parallel threshold. So if you have say four Rosies, you can set the followers to be in what we call parallel, uh, parallel threshold to be on on the followers. And what that means is they just turn themselves off when they're not needed. So when the primary Rosie sees a big load, it has to wake them up real quick and bring them online, which happens really quick. But if it's a huge load, like a 70 kilowatt motor load, for example, it may not be quick enough. So if you're doing something of that caliber, you just disable the, uh, 
parallel threshold on the on the followers, and uh, that takes care of that. That's going to result in a so slightly this, higher parasitic load, though. But you know, at least gives them does, the, right. the power that they would need to yeah. be able to support these big loads. Yes, every follower is gonna you're gonna burn 30 watts continuous to leave it on versus you know the five watts to be in what we'd call you know standby mode. So so you have to balance that if your needs right. If your needs are to start a a 70 kilowatt motor for some reason, then you're gonna want to turn that off. But if you're doing a, a residential service where it's a very rare occasion and the loads or the loads are smaller but cumulative then parallel threshold works great and it will bring them on as needed and when the, the power drops it'll turn them back off i think it's about 50 percent and when it's not needed it turns it back off um can you stack your inverters in two different buildings like a cabin and a barn so i assume the question there is can you stack the ac side based on two different dc systems and currently the answer is no uh, currently the rosies all need to be on the same battery but interestingly enough, we're working with a mobile OEM who wants to do separate batteries on each Rosie, but parallel them on the AC sides. Sort of like Sunny Island did with the multi-cluster. So I do suspect you may see something interesting like that, where you could have a system in a house and a system in a barn and couple the AC sides of them together and the Rosies will still communicate. But that's not something that's on the, on the drawing board right at the moment. Can it output 50 hertz in 12240 split phase? Uh, not currently. I mean, it could, but not currently. Currently, the the uh, the 60 50 hertz is 230 volts only. Um, so if there was a need for that, though, it certainly could. It's just programming. What about separate batteries on stacked rosies? We sort of covered that earlier with the first question. Currently, the all the stacked rosies require the same battery. But in the near future, I do believe you're going to see each one, um, you know, have the ability to use its own battery. And can the Rosie communicate with home grid batteries? That is something that is in the works. Um, I suspect that we will see that probably in the next two or three weeks. And then the last question is, when will stacking be available? I plan to push a firmware to the beta app this week. Probably every Wednesday we have a rosy status meeting and probably after Wednesday I'll push the firmware to the beta app. So by Wednesday or Thursday of this week, we will have firmware available on our website that will allow for stacking rosies. Now, I will caveat that and say that our e-panel is really designed for a single rosy. So if you are going to call up and buy two rosies from James right now, he's going to have to get creative to explain to you how to you know, rip out the bypass or something. Uh, we don't actually have the load centers to support that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and, we would probably uh, just AC parallel them to an AC load center on the AC inputs and AC outputs, and then maybe use a battery combiner for your DC breakers. Um, and then, uh, you know, deal with the, well, the Barcelonas would have their own uh, load centers as well, which is really nice about having the charge controllers have their own load centers. You can kind of uh, focus that differently and. The Minai has plenty of options for this. It's not really difficult to do. We can just use yeah, a 200 yeah. amp, you know, double throw yep. for your bypass. So easy peasy. Yep. Nope. Lots of options. Yeah, lots of options. So just, you know, reach out to James or somebody at Nods if you want to do that. Or reach out to Midnight Solar. Support at MidnightSolar.com. Give us a call. Uh, the last question is the warranty. And the, the inverter itself comes with a five-year warranty. I believe if you buy it pre-wired, it comes with a seven-year warranty. And then if we can get our ducks in a row here quickly, we, like I said, we're going to be rolling out a certified installer program sometime here in the next two to three months, where once the installer is actually certified, then he can pass on a certificate to the homeowner that gives them an extra two years in warranty on top of whatever warranties they already had. So it's uh, five year on the inverter, seven on a pre-wired and two additional if it's done by a certified installer once that program's in place. Perfect. Is that all the questions? That is at the moment, yep. Perfect, uh, we, we're about eight minutes over. I think this was very successful. Uh, a lot of good things said. Um, thank you, Ryan, for and midnight for for hosting this um and again if anybody has any questions don't hesitate to 
give our team a call or shoot us an email, visit our website. You can chat with us on our website. Uh, we're here to help and we all love Midnight. So let's rock it. Oh, well, we appreciate you having us today. I appreciate everybody taking the time to, to listen to us babble today. So uh, yeah, any questions, definitely reach out to us.